Welcome to Legendary Law, where we dive deep into the riveting stories of history and bring them to life in the language of today. We're about to embark on a journey back to ancient times, to the days of mighty Rome and the legendary Julius Caesar. In this series, we're exploring none other than Caesar's account of the Gallic War, a war that forever shaped the history of Europe. However, rather than sticking to the classical language, we're serving this epic tale in a more modern style. Instead of focusing on deciphering Caesar's original words, you can concentrate on the real meat of the story. This episode is the start of a thrilling adventure through the first half of Book One. We'll be tracing the steps of Caesar's army, witnessing their struggles, their triumphs, and the grand strategies that led to their success. As we recount the tactics, the battles, and the political maneuverings, we invite you to immerse yourself in the life and times of the great Julius Caesar. So sit back, relax, and let's take a trip back in time to the Gallic War. All right, let's break it down. Imagine Gaul as a big pie cut into three slices. One slice is home to the Belgae, another to the Aquitani, and the last one is occupied by folks who call themselves Celts, but we like to call them Gauls. Each group has its own unique language, traditions, and rules. The Gauls and Aquitani are split by the Garonne River, while the Marne and Seine rivers make a natural boundary between the Gauls and Belgae. Now, among these groups, the Belgae are the bravest. They live the furthest from our sophisticated lifestyle and they don't get a lot of traders bringing in goods that could soften them up. Plus, they've got the Germans living across the Rhine River and they're always getting into scrapes with them. This is why the Helvetii, who are also up for a brawl with the Germans nearly every day, are among the bravest of all Gauls too. Now, the Gauls' piece of the pie starts at the Rhone River and stretches to the Garonne River and the ocean with the Belgae territories along its edges. It also brushes up against the Sequani and the Helvetii at the Rhine River and heads north. The Belgae slice begins at the far edge of Gaul, runs to the lower part of the Rhine River, and faces north and the rising sun. Finally, Aquitania's slice goes from the Garonne River to the Pyrenees Mountains and the part of the ocean closest to Spain. Its orientation is between the sunset and the North Star. Among the Helvetii, there was this guy, Orgatorix, who was the richest and most influential of them all. Around 61 BC, when Marcus Messala and Marcus Piso were big shots in Rome, Orgatorix got this idea in his head that he wanted to rule. So, he conspired with the elite and convinced the people to pack up their stuff and leave their homeland. He told them, hey, we're the bravest of the lot. We could totally rule all of Gaul. His plan didn't seem so crazy, because the Helvetii were sort of boxed in by geography. One side of their territory was hemmed in by the Rhine, a massive river that put a good distance between them and the Germans. On another side, they had the Jura, a towering mountain range, acting as a wall between them and the Sequani. Then, on a third side, they had Lake Geneva and the Rhone River, keeping them separate from our province. This meant they couldn't travel far or pick fights with their neighbours as easily as they would have liked. For a tribe as battle-happy as the Helvetii, it was a real downer. They felt their territory was too small, given their large population and reputation for being great warriors. Even though their land stretched 240 miles long and 180 miles wide, for them it was like living in a shoebox. Motivated by all this, and swayed by Orgatorix's persuasive words, the Helvetii decided to get their ducks in a row for a big move. They started gathering beasts of burden, wagons, and planting as much crops as possible to ensure they had enough grub on the road. They also decided to play nice with their neighbouring states and make peace. They figured it would take about two years to pull this off, and so they planned to hit the road in the third year. Orgatorix was the man they put in charge of making all this happen. On his diplomatic trips to the neighbouring states, Orgatorix convinced Casticus, a guy from the Sequani tribe, whose dad was a bigwig and a friend of the Roman Senate, to grab power in his own tribe, just like his dad did. He also managed to persuade Dumnorix, a popular leader from the Aedui and brother of Divitiacus, to do the same, and even offered his daughter's hand in marriage to seal the deal. Orgatorix made it sound like a walk in the park. He said, hey, I'm about to rule the Helvetii, who are the strongest in Gaul, and don't worry, I've got the muscle and the manpower to help you guys take over too. Pumped by his words, they made a pact, swearing to help each other rise to power with the ultimate goal of ruling all of Gaul with their three kick-ass tribes. Well, this grand plan didn't stay secret for long. Some tattletales spilled the beans to the Helvetii, who then did what they usually do in such cases. They slapped chains on Orgatorix and made him stand trial. The rule was, if found guilty, he'd be looking at a fiery end. But Orgatorix was no pushover. On his trial day, he rallied an army of his followers, about 10,000 people, including those who owed him money and favours, to the courthouse. 
With this show of strength, he wriggled out of having to defend himself. The state was super ticked off and ready to flex its muscles. The bigwigs started rounding up a crowd to deal with Orgatorix and his gang, but then suddenly Orgatorix was gone. He was dead, just like that, and it smelled fishy. The Helvety couldn't shake off the suspicion that he might have taken his own life. Even after Orgatorix's sudden exit, the Helvety didn't abandon their big plan to leave their homeland. Once they felt ready, they took a pretty drastic step. They torched their own towns, about twelve of them, plus around four hundred villages, and any other homes that were left. They even burned up their food supply, keeping just enough to take with them. It was a hardcore move to cut off any chance of turning back, and made them ready to face whatever was coming their way. Everyone was told to pack enough food for three months, but they didn't plan to go it alone. They convinced their neighbours, the Rorachi, the Tulingi, and the Latobrigi, to jump on the bandwagon, burn their towns and villages, and hit the road with them. They also welcomed the Boi into their crew. These guys had been living across the Rhine and had recently moved to Norican territory after causing a ruckus in Norea. There were two possible ways for the Helveti to skip town. One was through Sequani territory, which was pretty gnarly, squeezed between Mount Jura and the Rhone River. It was so narrow you could barely squeeze a wagon through. Plus, it had this super steep mountain hanging over it, making it easy for a few folks to block their path. The other option was cruising through our province, which was way easier and obstacle-free. The Rhone River divided the Helvetes land from the Allobroges, who we had just brought under our control, and you could cross the river at certain spots. Geneva, the furthest Allobroges city and closest to the Helvetii, was connected to Helvetii territory by a bridge. The Helvetii figured they could either sweet-talk the Allobroges, who weren't exactly besties with the Romans, into letting them pass or just strong-arm their way through. Once they got all their prep work done, they set a date for the big move. Everyone was to meet up on the Rhone riverbank. This was going down on March 28th, during the time Lucius Piso and Aulus Gabinius were the head honchos in Rome, which was 58 BC in our calendar. When Caesar got word that they were planning to roll right through our province, he took off from Rome and hit the road, making a beeline for further Gaul, finally landing in Geneva. He ordered every town in the province to send as many soldiers as they could muster. After all, there was only one Roman legion in further Gaul. He also ordered the Geneva Bridge to be dismantled. Getting wind of Caesar's arrival, the Helvetii sent their big shots, guys like Numaeus and Verodoctius, to do some damage control. They told Caesar, Look, we're just passing through your province. We promise we won't wreck the place. We've got no other route, so can we get a thumbs up from you? Now, Caesar hadn't forgotten that the Helvetii had once handed Lucius Cassius, a consul, his backside, and then made his army literally pass under a yoke. So he wasn't exactly in the mood to do them any favours. He didn't buy the idea that, if given a free pass, these guys wouldn't stir up trouble. But Caesar played it cool, buying himself some time until his new recruits could show up. He told the ambassadors, let me mull it over. If you've got anything else to discuss, swing back around April 12th. In the meantime, Caesar got busy. He rallied his legion and the recruits from the province, and they went all out constructing a 16-foot high wall stretching over 18 miles from Lake Geneva, which feeds into the Rhone River right up to Mount Jura, which separates the Sequani and Helvetii territories. Once that mega-project was done, he stationed garrisons and fortified outposts all along it, ready to stop the Helvetii in their tracks if they tried to push through without his go-ahead. When the appointed meeting day rolled around and the Helvetii ambassadors came back, Caesar held his ground. He told them, Look, it's not in the Roman playbook to let anyone just stroll through our province, try to strong-arm your way through, and you'll find us pushing back. Faced with this setback, the Helvetii got desperate, trying to cross over using boat bridges, homemade rafts, and even wading through the shallowest parts of the Rhone. They tried their luck both day and night. But thanks to our robust fortifications, the sheer number of our soldiers, and a rain of arrows, their efforts went down the drain. So they gave up on that plan. So there was only one road left for the Helvetii, and that was through Sequani territory. But this route was a tight squeeze and they couldn't pass without a thumbs-up from the Sequani. Since they weren't making any headway convincing the Sequani themselves, they roped in Domnorix and influential Aeduan to smooth things over for them. Domnorix had a lot of pull with the Sequani. He was a popular guy, known for his generosity, and he had a soft spot for the Helvetii because he'd married Orgatorix's daughter from that tribe. Plus, he was power-hungry and always looking for ways to win over as many states as he could with his goodwill. So, he stepped in and managed to convince the Sequani to let the Helvetii march through their land. To seal the deal, he got them to swap hostages as a form of insurance. 
the Sequani would guarantee they wouldn't hinder the Helvetii's passage, and the Helvetii would pledge to move through without causing any trouble or damage. Then, word reached Caesar that the Helvetii were planning to march through Sequani and Aedui lands, heading towards the territory of the Santones, which was just a stone's throw from Tolosa, a city in our province. If that happened, the province could be in a real jam, having a tribe of battle-hardened, Roman-hating folks right on the doorstep of a lush, open stretch of land. With this in mind, Caesar put his lieutenant, Titus Labienus, in charge of the fortification he had built, and then hightailed it to Italy. He hustled to raise two more legions and brought out three others that had been hibernating near Aquilia. With these five legions, he dashed across the Alps, taking the quickest route into further Gaul. Along the way, the Centrones, Graeselli and Catrigis tried to block his path from their high ground positions. But after handing them a few defeats, Caesar made it to the Vocanti territory in further Gaul in just seven days from Oslum, the furthest town in Hither Gaul. From there, he moved his army through Allobrogian territory and then on to the Segusiani. These folks were the first ones you'd bump into across the Rhone, just outside our province. By this time, the Helvetii had managed to squeeze their forces through the narrow passage and Sequani territory and were now tearing through Aedui lands. The Aedui, unable to defend themselves and their possessions, reached out to Caesar for help. They pointed out they'd always been strong allies to the Roman people, so it didn't seem right that their fields were being trashed, their kids enslaved and their towns attacked, almost within view of our army. Meanwhile, the Ambari, who were buddies and relatives of the Edui, let Caesar know that, with their fields wrecked, they were having a hard time keeping the enemy from their town gates. The Allobroges, who had homes and properties across the Rhone, were running to Caesar for help, saying that all they had left was the dirt under their feet. Seeing all this, Caesar decided he couldn't just sit around and wait for the Helvetii to finish tearing up his allies' lands and start in on the Santones. There's this river, the Sion, that meanders through Aedui and Sequani territories into the Rhone, and it moves so darn slow you can't even tell which way it's flowing by looking at it. The Helvetii were using rafts and makeshift boats to get across it. When Caesar's spies let him know that three quarters of the Helvetii forces had crossed, but a quarter was still on this side of the Sion, he got moving. Leaving camp with three legions in the dead of night, he caught up with the group still waiting to cross. With them weighed down by their gear and totally not expecting a fight, he wiped out a huge chunk of them. The ones who survived ran for the nearest woods. Now, this particular group was called the Tigurine, one of four factions making up the Helveti. And here's an interesting twist. It was this group, a generation or so back, that killed the consul Lucius Cassius and made his army surrender in shame. So, whether by pure chance or divine intervention, the part of the Helveti that had caused such heartache for the Romans were the first to get hit hard. And for Caesar, this was personal, not just public payback. The Tigurini had killed Lucius Piso in the same battle as Cassius. Piso was the granddad of Lucius Calpurnius Piso, who just happened to be Caesar's father-in-law. So you could say Caesar had a score to settle. After the dust from the battle had settled, Caesar wanted to catch up with the remaining Helveti forces. To do that, he had a bridge built across the Saone, moving his army across it. The Helveti caught off guard by how quickly Caesar made this move, something that had taken them 20 days to achieve, decided to send envoys to negotiate. Their leader was this guy Divico, who used to command the Helveti back when they were fighting Cassius. His pitch to Caesar went something like this. Look, if you Romans want peace, we're cool with that. Just tell us where to go and we'll stay put. But if you're looking for a fight, remember that we've embarrassed you before. And also, don't forget that we're pretty tough ourselves. As for that surprise attack you pulled, don't let it go to your head. We couldn't help our friends in time because of the river, that's all. We were taught to value bravery over sneaky tactics. So don't make the mistake of underestimating us and let this spot become infamous as a Roman graveyard, okay? Caesar's response went like this. The very fact that you brought up those old grudges is exactly why I can't let this go. It pisses me off that you guys hurt us when we did nothing to provoke it. If we were guilty of something, we could have defended ourselves. But you caught us off guard because we didn't think we had anything to worry about. Now, I could maybe forget the past, but what about the recent stuff? You guys trying to force your way through our province, picking fights with the Aedui, the Ambari and the Allobroges. You're pretty smug about that so-called victory of yours, and I'm shocked at how long you've gotten away with this. But here's the thing. The gods have a way of letting people who've done wrong enjoy success for a while, only to make the fall even harder. But let's cut to the chase. If you give me some hostages as a guarantee of your promises and make it up to the Aedui and the Allobroges for the harm you've done, we can make peace. 
Divico hit back, saying, Our ancestors taught us to take, not give hostages. The Romans of all people should know that. After dropping that mic, he walked off. The next day they pack up and hit the road. Caesar does the same, but he also sends his cavalry of 4,000 guys, picked from all over the province and the allied Aedui, to keep tabs on where the enemy's headed. Now our guys got a bit too gung-ho chasing the Helvetii's tail and ended up in a scrap in a bad spot. And we lost a few good men. This gave the Helvetii a big head. They thought they were hot stuff because they'd pushed back our huge cavalry with just 500 of their own. They even had the audacity to start messing with us from the back line. But Caesar kept our guys cool, figuring for now it was enough just to keep the Helvetii from looting and pillaging. For about 15 days we kept this up, never more than 5 or 6 miles between our front and their back. Meanwhile Caesar was constantly on the Aedui's case for the grain they had promised. Because of the chilly climate up north in Gaul, not only were the fields not ready for harvest, but we were running low on stored feed too. And the grain he'd brought by a boat up the Somme? He couldn't get to it without backing off from the Helvetii, who had changed their course from the river. The Aedui just kept putting him off, saying, It's on the way, it's being gathered. But Caesar was running out of patience and time, with the day fast approaching when he'd have to distribute grain to his soldiers. So he pulls together the Aedui leaders he has in camp, including big names like Divitiacus and Liscus, who was the top dog that year. The Aedui call this role the Virgo Bratus, and it's a pretty big deal elected annually. This guy had life or death power over his people. Caesar gives them a piece of his mind. He's miffed that they're not stepping up when things are so dire, with the enemy close and no grain to buy or harvest. Especially since he'd taken on this war largely because of their pleas, it feels like a slap in the face to be left high and dry. Finally, after Caesar's harsh words, Liscus spills the beans on something he'd been keeping under wraps. He says, Look, there are a few big shots around here who, even though they're just civilians, have more pull than the officials. These folks are stirring up trouble, telling the common folk not to give up their grain. They're saying that if they can't stay on top in Gaul, it's better to be under Gaul rule than Roman. They're convinced that if the Romans beat the Helvetii, we Aedui will lose our freedom along with the rest of Gaul. And it's these same guys who are leaking our plans and camp activities to the enemy. I can't control them. Heck, I know I'm putting myself at great risk just by telling you this, which is why I've kept my mouth shut until now. Caesar realizes from Liscus' story that he's talking about Dumnorix, Divitiacus' brother, but he doesn't want to dive into it with everyone there, so he wraps up the meeting quickly and keeps Liscus back for a private chat. Liscus lays it all out on the table, speaking much more freely. Caesar then checks the story with others and finds out it's all true. The guy stirring up all this trouble is Dumnorix, who's quite the risk-taker and a people's favorite thanks to his generosity. He's a man hungry for power and change. He's been winning the contracts for the local taxes and customs duties for years now because no one dares to compete against him. This strategy has made him wealthy and given him a ton of resources for bribing people. He keeps a large number of horsemen around him, and it's not just here. He's got influence in neighboring states too. He's strategically extended his influence by marrying his mother off to a high-ranking man among the Bituriges, taking a wife from the Helvetii and marrying his half-sister and other female relatives into different tribes. He's got a soft spot for the Helvetii because of these family ties, but he's no fan of Caesar or the Romans. Their arrival has undercut his power and put his brother Divitiacus back in the spotlight. Dumb Norix figures if anything happens to the Romans, he could use the Helvetii to take over. But as long as the Romans are in charge, he's worried about losing not just his shot at being king, but even the influence he's got now. Caesar also learns that Dumb Norix was the one who triggered the cavalry route a few days ago. He was in charge of the Aedui cavalry sent to back up Caesar. And when Dumnorix and his men took off, the rest of the horsemen panicked and followed. After piecing together the facts, Caesar realized Dumnorix had some serious explaining to do. The guy had guided the Helvetii through Sequanilands, set up a hostage exchange, all without orders from Caesar or his own people. Even the Aedui had no clue what he was up to. Dumnorix got an earful from the Aedui's head honcho, and Caesar felt there was enough evidence to either punish him personally or get the Aedui to handle it. But there was a catch. Caesar knew that Dumnorix's brother, Divitiacus, held the Roman people in high regard and was deeply loyal to Caesar himself. He was also known for his integrity and level-headedness. Caesar was worried that punishing Dumnorix might upset Divitiacus, so he decided to chat with Divitiacus before making any moves. He called Divitiacus over and sent away the regular translators. Instead, he used his close friend and trusted confidant, Caius Valerius Priscillus, who was a big shot in the province of Gaul. Caesar reminded Divitiacus about what was said about Dumnorix at the Gaul Council meeting and what people had told him privately. 
He asked Divitiacus to make a judgment about his brother without taking it personally. If not, Caesar urged him to get the Aedui to handle it. Divitiacus, all choked up, threw his arms around Caesar, pleading with him not to be too hard on his brother. He admitted that he knew the allegations were true, and that nobody was more hurt by them than he was. Divitiacus had built up a lot of sway in Gaul, while Dumnorix, who was younger, hadn't. But Divitiacus had used his influence to boost Dumnorix's reputation and power, which Dumnorix then used to undermine Divitiacus. Despite all this, he was still his brother, and he didn't want to see him hurt. Divitiacus was also worried that if Caesar came down too hard on Dumnorix, people might think he'd given his approval, given his close ties with Caesar. This could turn the whole of Gaul against him. While Divitiacus was tearfully laying all this out, Caesar took his hand, comforted him, and asked him to stop worrying. He assured Divitiacus that his friendship meant a lot to him, so much so that he was willing to overlook both the harm Dumnorix had done to the Republic and to him personally. Caesar called Dumnorix in with his brother in tow and laid out his concerns. He pointed out what Dumnorix had done wrong, what he'd noticed himself, and what the state had complained about. He warned him to avoid any suspicious activity in the future and declared that he was letting the past slide for the sake of Divitiacus. However, Caesar wasn't taking any chances and decided to keep tabs on Dumnorix to see who he was meeting and what he was up to. On the same day, Caesar's scouts came back with news that the enemy had set up camp at the bottom of a mountain, about eight miles from where they were. He sent out a team to check out the mountain, see how steep it was and what the best way to get up there might be. They reported back that it looked pretty manageable. In the middle of the night, he instructed his lieutenant, Titus Labienus, a guy with serious power, to lead two legions to the top of the mountain. He gave him a couple of people who knew the area to help guide them and shared his plans. In the early morning, Caesar followed along the same path the enemy had taken, sending his cavalry ahead. He also sent out Publius Considius, a seasoned veteran who had served under both Lucius Sulla and Marcus Crassus, to scout ahead. At dawn, Titus Labienus had control of the mountain's peak, and Caesar himself was no more than a mile and a half away from the enemy's camp. He learned from captives that neither his nor Labienus's arrivals had been noticed. Just then, Considius rode up to him at full speed, reporting that the enemy had claimed the mountain Caesar had intended for Labienus. He said he knew this from spotting Gallic weapons and flags. Reacting to this, Caesar led his forces to the nearest hill and got them in battle formation. Labienus, following Caesar's orders, didn't engage the enemy until he saw Caesar's troops near the enemy camp. The idea was to attack from all sides at once. Labienus held his position on the mountain, waiting for Caesar's forces and avoiding combat. As the day wore on, Caesar got word from his spies that his men had indeed taken the mountain and that the Helvetii had relocated their camp. Turns out, Considius had freaked out and reported seeing something that wasn't there. Caesar kept trailing the enemy at the usual distance that day and set up his own camp about three miles from where the enemy was camped. The following day, Caesar had only two days' worth of food left for his army, and he was only about 18 miles from Bibracti, the biggest and most well-stocked city of the Aedui. He figured he should get some more food, so he changed course from the Helvetii and made a beeline for Bibracti. Some defectors from Lucius Aemilius's Gallic cavalry unit tipped off the enemy about this move. The Helvetii saw this and changed their game plan. They either thought that the Romans were backing down out of fear, especially since they had taken the high ground the day before, but didn't engage in battle, or they figured they might cut off the Romans' supply line. So they started to follow and hassle the Romans from behind. Seeing this, Caesar moved his troops to the nearest hill and sent his cavalry to hold off the enemy's attack. He set up his four seasoned legions in three lines in the middle of the hill, placing the two legions he'd recently recruited in Gaul and all the auxiliary troops at the very top. He commanded the men to spread out across the whole hill while the baggage was gathered together in one spot and defended by the forces at the upper line. The Helvetii followed suit, getting all their wagons together and forming a phalanx after pushing back our cavalry. They then marched in tight formation up to our front line. Caesar, wanting to level the playing field and remove the temptation to flee, ordered all the horses, including his own, out of sight. He then rallied his men and initiated the fight. His soldiers, armed with javelins, attacked from higher ground and broke up the enemy's tight formation. When the phalanx scattered, they advanced, drawing their swords. The Gauls had a tough time fighting. One good javelin throw from a Roman could pin their shields together. 
With the iron points bending on impact, they couldn't pull the javelins free, and they found it hard to fight with their left hands all tangled up. Many struggled with it for a while, then decided to just ditch their shields and fight unprotected. Eventually the Gauls, wounded and weary, started to retreat, heading for a nearby mountain about a mile away. Just when the Gauls reached the mountain and our men were moving in, the Boyi and Tulingi, about 15,000 strong, who had been serving as a rear guard and trailing the Helvetes' march, attacked our troops on their exposed side, looking to surround them. Seeing this, the Helveti, who had retreated to the mountain, started to push back and re-engage in the fight. Reacting quickly, the Romans pivoted and charged in two groups, the first and second line to hold off those they'd just beaten and driven off the field, and the third line to deal with the new arrivals. The fight was fierce and lasted for hours, with neither side clearly gaining the upper hand. When our men's onslaught became too much, one group of the enemy headed for the mountain while the other fell back to their baggage and wagons. Remarkably, despite the fight raging from noon till dusk, not a single enemy was spotted fleeing. The battle even spilled over to the enemy's baggage area and lasted into the night. They had used their wagons like a makeshift wall, and from the higher ground they hurled weapons down on our men. Some even hid between wagons and wheels, stabbing at our men with lances and javelins. Eventually, after hours of battle, our men overran the enemy's camp and baggage area. Among those captured were the daughter and a son of Augatorix. But even after the battle, about 130,000 of the enemy survived and didn't waste any time. They marched all night, non-stop, and reached the Lingoni's territory on the fourth day. Our men had to hold back for three days, tending to the wounded and burying the fallen, so they couldn't immediately follow. Caesar sent messages to the Lingonis, warning them not to help the enemy with food or anything else. He made it clear, if they aided them, they'd be treated just like the enemy. After waiting three days, Caesar and his entire force began their pursuit. The Helvetii, finding themselves in a tough spot with no resources left, decided to send negotiators to Caesar to discuss surrender. When they met Caesar on the road, they fell at his feet, tears streaming down their faces as they begged for mercy. He instructed them to wait for his arrival where they were, and they obeyed. Upon Caesar's arrival, he demanded hostages, their weapons, and the return of the slaves who had defected to the Helvetii. During the scramble to gather all of this, about 6,000 men from the Verbigain tribe took advantage of the chaos. Fearful of the consequences after surrendering their weapons, or perhaps hopeful that in the vast crowd their absence wouldn't be noticed, they fled the Helvetii's camp as soon as night fell. Their destination? the Rhine and the lands of the Germans. Upon discovering the escape, Caesar directed the local communities through which the escapees had fled to track them down and bring them back if they wanted to remain in his good books. When they were returned, he regarded them as enemies. The rest, however, he accepted their surrender after they handed over hostages, weapons and deserters. He instructed the Helvetii, the Tulingi and the Latabrigi to return to their original territories. Given their lands had been decimated and food was scarce, he commanded the Allobroges to provide them with ample grain. He also ordered them to rebuild the towns and villages they had previously destroyed. Caesar's primary motive for this was to prevent the fertile lands of the Helveti from being unoccupied, which might encourage the Germans from across the Rhine to move into these lands. This would bring them closer to Gaul's province and the Allobroges. Responding to the Eidui's request, he allowed them to settle the Boi, known for their exceptional bravery, within their territories. The Eidui provided these newcomers with land and eventually extended them the same rights and privileges they themselves enjoyed. In the Helvetes camp, Caesar's men found a detailed census written in Greek. It listed individually how many men were fit for battle and also separately counted boys, elders and women. Here's what it looked like. Helveti. 263,000, Tulingi, 36,000, Latobrigi, 14,000, Raurachi, 23,000, Boi, 32,000. The total count was about 368,000. Of these, around 92,000 were combat ready. Later, when Caesar commanded a count of those who managed to return home, it turned out to be just 110,000. And there you have it, brothers and sisters. We've travelled through the first half of Book 1 of Julius Caesar's accounts of the Gallic War, where we've walked in the footsteps of ancient armies and witnessed great conflicts, cunning strategies and political intrigue. But the journey isn't over yet. We'll continue to uncover the remaining half of Book 1 in the next part of our series on the Gallic Wars. Will Caesar conquer or will he falter in the face of adversity? There are more battles to fight, more strategies to devise and more history to unfold. So stay tuned for the upcoming chapters of this epic tale. Thank you for joining us in revisiting this pivotal time in history.